The committee will come to order. Today's hearing is entitled, Has Dodd-Frank Ended Too Big to Fail? Uh, this is uh, the uh, Special Inspector General for TARP, Mr. Borofsky's last day on the job. Um, and he's had uh, an eventful two and a half years. Um, it's probably felt like a lifetime. And um, we certainly appreciate your service, and we appreciate you being here uh, on your final day on the job. Um, but uh, as has uh, been tradition for our subcommittee, we begin by reading the Oversight and Government Reforms, uh, Reform Committee's mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, America has a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission statement of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. It is also very similar to the mission statement of Inspector Generals across our go government. Today's hearing will explore whether our largest financial institutions <coughs> will start I uh, will start by giving an open statement, so we will start the time now. Uh, today's hearing will explore whether our largest financial institutions are still too big to fail. Despite passage of the Dodd-Frank Act and subsequent financial regulations, specifically we are concerned about the ongoing perception that government bailouts remain an option for poorly managed financial firms. The bottom line is that 2,300 pages are over that. Dodd-Frank was supposed to end too big to fail. As it turns out, Dodd-Frank has only reinforced the bailout culture, perpetuated the moral hazard of government intervention, and tipped the economic scales for a few at the expense of growth and competition. And as January 2011 quarterly report to Congress, the Special Inspector General for TARP, Mr. Borofsky, outlined his concerns with a lasting legacy of too big to fail. This report detailed the unfair competitive advantage of certain financial institutions with implicit government support. Through inflated credit ratings and greater access to cheap credit, these institutions receive benefits that crowd out their smaller competitors. Uh, competitors. Those findings were backed up by data from the FDIC, which found the large financial institutions paid 78 basis points less to borrow funds than their smaller <coughs> rivals. This point was not lost on credit rating agencies who now take implicit government backing into account when rating credit worthiness. This, finding advan this funding advantage is the result of the market perception that certain institutions are just simply too big to fail. Dodd-Frank codifies open-ended ad hoc dealmaking like we saw in the financial crisis of 2008. And if that was not enough, Secretary Geithner stated to the Special Inspector General in December 2010 that in the future we may have to do exceptional things again. And he said this well after the passage of Dodd-Frank. The combination of an implicit government guarantee and cheap money only reinforces the moral hazard that Dodd-Frank failed to eliminate. Instead of taking bailouts off the table, the Federal Government has given large uh, institutions a special preferred status. Last November, voters delivered a very loud message to Washington. They don't want their hard-earned tax dollars going to any more bailouts. The American taxpayer does not want their government in the business of picking winners and losers. We need to create a competitive lending environment where small businesses can gain access to capital and thrive, where they can feel confident in the credit markets and start creating jobs again. By recognizing our government's ongoing willingness to bail out large institutions, we can begin to have an honest conversation about ending too big to fail. I am interested to hear what uh, our first panel and second panel uh, have to say about this matter. On the first panel, we are going to have the Special Inspector General for TARP. On the second panel, we will have uh, a representative from Treasury, um, Mr. Massad, who is the uh, acting under Secretary for Financial Stability. With that, I would like to yield the balance of my time to the Chairman of the full committee, Mr. Issa. I thank the Chairman for holding this hearing, and I thank uh, the Chairman for yielding his time. I really just wanted to thank uh, a unique individual in the, uh, if there is a, a, a wall of fame for IGs, uh, Neil, you are going to be on it. Uh, you have done an amazingly good job. I, I looked at your, uh, your op-ed this morning and said, darn, he got the title we should have had. It is entitled, Where the Bailout Went Wrong. 
So I look forward to hearing your, your thoughts on, regardless of good intentions of Dodd-Frank and of the TARP bill, where we should learn from the mistakes that probably were inevitable, but uh, due to your hard work, they are very public, and we intend to address them one by one. So as you go off to academia uh, to teach and to write, I hope you will uh, you'll consider an invitation to come back here exactly that, an invitation, one where we want your counsel in whatever form it can be provided. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this, uh, this hearing, uh, one of many in your series, and taking seriously the special uh, committee responsibilities for oversight. And again, nobody is more a hero here than a great IG, and we have a great IG in front of us. I yield back. I thank the Chairman. And this time I yield five minutes to uh, the ranking mem member, Mr. Quigley, and by prior agreement, uh, he, he will uh, share his time with the, the full committee ranking member as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this meeting. Uh, <clears throat> and again, I would like to thank our, our guest today, Mr. Rowski, for his work at SIGTARP. Uh, we appreciate all you have done for us. One of the lessons of the financial crisis is that if the government bears too much risk, then taxpayers are left vulnerable to huge losses. More importantly, if firms perceive that taxpayers will cover their losses, then those firms have an incentive to take even bigger risk. And as these overleveraged firms grow in size, they can become too big to fail, in effect passing all their risk on to taxpayers who would not allow a financial collapse. TARP, which was passed by Congress and signed by President Bush, averted a catastrophe. And although TARP will likely end up as a net profit for taxpayers, we should not minimize the fact that it exposed taxpayers to unacceptable losses. Today we must continue to safeguard our financial system against collapse. TARP did not create too big to fail, but it did reinforce it. The Dodd-Frank law is an attempt to roll back those perverse incentives that cause firms to become too big to fail. It establishes stronger prudential regulation, closing many of the loopholes that allowed excessive risk-taking. It created a systemic risk reg regulator to oversee all financial firms that are systemically important. Most importantly, it creates a special resolution authority for failing firms to end bailouts and impose losses on shareholders. Resolution authority success or failure will be judged on whether the market perceives it as a credible alternative to bailouts. For me, this is the key question. Does the market view resolution authority as a credible alternative to bailouts? It is my understanding that implementation of Dodd-Frank is still in its early stages. I am hopeful that the result will be a predictable, credible and orderly process for unwinding failing financial firms. Addressing the too-big-to-fail problem is even more important today than before the financial crisis. In 1999, the five largest U.S. banking institutions controlled 38 percent of all banking industry assets. Today, they control 52 percent of banking assets. To fix this problem, we need to ensure that Dodd-Frank is successfully implemented. I look forward to hearing testimony from our witnesses, and I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member of the full committee. Thank the gentleman for yielding, thank, and I thank the chairman for calling the hearing this morning. Unfortunately, today's hearing represents a tragically missed opportunity in the majority's refusal to grant the request to invite Representative Barney Frank to testify before the subcommittee as the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee throughout the drafting of the financial regulatory reform legislation and as the current ranking member monitoring the implementation of that legislation, Representative Frank's expertise on the matters before us today is unparalleled. Uh, we would have benefited greatly from uh, if we were able to hear from him. But despite the disappointment in the subcommittee's process, I thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. I particularly recognize our uh, Special Inspector General Borowski, and I, too, commend you for a job well done. I want to thank you for working with me and uh, the many times I have bugged you to, to do reports and look into things. I really do appreciate it. Your tireless work has enabled us to better fulfill our role in ensuring efficient and effective government oversight of the TARP program. And again, I thank you. In the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, enact, uh, we enacted uh, Dodd-Frank in order to set into place a robust regulatory structure to end too big to fail. According to FDIC Chairwoman Sheila Baird, the new requirements under Dodd-Frank will ensure that the largest financial companies can be wound down in an orderly fashion without taxpayer costs. 
under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, there are no more bailouts. However, as Chairwoman uh, Baer uh, has said, and Mr. Rocky, Borowski and others have acknowledged, Dodd-Frank will not work unless we provide our regulators with the resources they need to make full use of these new regulatory authorities. Frighteningly, the budget proposed by the new majority would effectively cripple the regulators. If we drastically cut the uh, budget of our agencies charged with carrying out this important regulation, we will be paving the way for the next financial collapse, and we will never be rid of uh, entities that are, in fact, too big to fail. And I trust that Mr. Morosky will comment on that, uh, with that the whole issue of uh, the need to make sure that these agencies are properly funded. Uh, I am looking forward to the hearing uh, from today's witnesses. And again, Mr. Barassi, I want to thank you for all that you have done. Uh, I know you are moving on to academia, uh, but we, I know that many students will benefit from what you have to say and what you have learned, and we hope you will return to government soon. May God bless you, and I yield back. Well, I thank the uh full committee ranking member and uh, in response to his uh, request to have uh, Mr. Frank uh, testify before the committee. I also serve on the Financial Services Committee. He is uh, ex officio a member of five subcommittees on that committee. Uh, he has been chairman of the Financial Services for the previous four years. He is the ranking member of the Financial Services. He has every venue to speak about his law that he passed. Today is about the implementation of Dodd-Frank and whether or not that has ended uh, the culture of too big to fail or whether or not it has propagated it. So we have two, uh, two panels today. Uh, one uh, is the Special Inspector General who oversees the program. The second panel is uh, the uh, Treasury Department, and they can, in essence, uh, have a full panel to themselves. In essence, we are giving the minority a full panel. And so uh, usually that is praised, but I certainly understand in this atmosphere it may not be. But uh, our first witness today is Mr. Neil Borofsky. He is the outgoing Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Prior to assuming his position in, in the, at the U.S. Treasury, Mr. Borofsky was a Federal Prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York for more than eight years. Uh, Mr. Borofsky's last day is today. Uh, I know his staff sitting behind him, uh, they are, well, they are not smiling. Uh, I think they are sad to see, uh, see you go, Mr. Borofsky, and we certainly appreciate your service to your government that you have rendered in the last two and a half years. We know it has been busy, it has been challenging, uh, and um, you have put more hours uh, into government service um, than you will ever be paid for. So we, we appreciate your service to your government um, and in the interest of openness. Um, so with that, it is the policy of the committee that all witnesses be sworn in to testify. If you will please ra uh, rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to receive, well, um, you are about to give, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Borowski. Uh, and so now we will give you an opportunity for your opening statement. Your written testimony will be entered in, into the record, but we would like to give you the opportunity to say what is on your mind. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings. Thank, thank you for, for your kind comments, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It is a, a privilege and an honor to testify before this subcommittee on this, my final day as Special Inspector General. It is hard to believe that two and a half years ago there was no such thing as TARP, no such thing as SIGTARP, certainly no such thing as a TARP subcommittee. And since that time, we have seen an historic outpouring and outlaying of government funds to a financial industry that was teetering on the brink of collapse, accompanied by historic oversight. The Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, or ESA, which of course created TARP, also created SIGTARP at, at Congress's insistence. And I am proud to say, that, that since our inception in December of 2008, we have made great progress to fulfilling the goals set forth for us by Congress. By the numbers alone, we have issued nine quarterly reports, 13 audits, secured civil or criminal charges against more than 50 individuals, 18 different defendants have been convicted of TARP-related fraud, and our investigations have helped assist to the recovery of or prevention to loss from fraud from 
more than $700 million, making sure that SIGTARP as an agency will more than pay for itself. As importantly, we have helped bring transparency and accountability to a program desperately in need of them. Treasury, through TARP, made a series of promises, both to Wall Street and to Main Street. Unfortunately, its track record has been mixed. It has fulfilled its promises to Wall Street as reflected in the return to record profitability of the Nation's largest banks. But unfortunately, it has failed to live up to some of its promises to Main Street. First, with respect to the promise to restore lending, such an important part of any economic recovery has gone unfulfilled. When Treasury gave out hundreds of billions of dollars to banks, it did so without any policy in place to accomplish that goal, without any strings to require lending or even provide incentives for it. Not surprisingly, credit continued to contract throughout the financial crisis and well into the recovery. Second, the promise to, restore, to, to preserve home ownership, such an important part of the legislative bargain that Treasury struck with Congress in order to get TARP passed lies in tatters. The original promise to modify up to $700 billion in mortgages that Treasury was, was to purchase under TARP cast aside within weeks after ESA was passed. That was replaced months later with a promise by, by this administration to modify up to 4 million mortgages for struggling homeowners. That promise, too, has essentially been cast aside replaced with the cold, stark reality of a failed program that was poorly designed, poorly managed, poorly executed, and will come nowhere close to living up to that original promise. Finally, after Secretary Paulson and then Secretary Geithner told the world that they would stand by and not let our largest banks fail and demonstrated that they were ready, willing, and able to use the TARP funds to accomplish that, we are left with a financial system and with largest banks that are bigger, more concentrated, and even more dangerous to the system than before the crisis. We were then promised that through regulatory reform, the era of bank bailouts would end, a promise that looks like it, too, may very well go unmet. Because notwithstanding the passage of Dodd-Frank, the financial markets still perceive that the United, Stever United States government will bail out the largest banks with credit rating agencies explicitly giving higher ratings to those banks based on the assumption that should they hit the rocks again, the United States government will come to their rescue. As to the execution of Dodd-Frank, it still remains theoretically possible that it will address the problems of too big to fail. Treasury and the regulators were certainly given the broad powers and authorities to take on the largest banks. But these are the same regulators whose incompetence and lack of foresight was described by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission as one of the causes of the financial crisis. And while Chairman Sheila Baer stands out as a strong advocate for using the tools of Dodd-Frank to either shrink or simplify the most complex financial institutions as necessary, she also appears to stand alone as her term quickly winds down. Without dramatic and quick action, I am afraid that this promise, too, will be broken with potentially devastating consequences. Mr. So Chairman, Ranking Member, um, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I also want to thank, thank you and, and the Chairman of the Full Committee and the Ranking Member of the Full Committee for your strong support over the years. At SIGTARP, we would not have been able to accomplish nearly any of our, our, our goals or our accomplishments if it wasn't for the strong, continuous, and above all, bipartisan support from Congress. If we had received only support from one side or the other, it would not have had nearly the impact that your uniform support have been for our office. So I thank you. I, I also want to thank the, the incredible men and women who work at SIGTARP for their sacrifices, their commitment. Uh, they demonstrate all the good that is in Federal workers, and it has truly been my privilege and honor to get to work with them for the last two-plus years. Um, so I thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Now, thank you for your testimony. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I think to, to initially start this question, you have mentioned in your reports, you have mentioned in your editorial today in the New York Times, um, that the objectives of TARP have been shifted dramatically in the two and a half years since the creation of the program. It's 
uh, not evolving, but it seems like if they fail to meet metrics that they set for themselves, that they, they change the metrics. Um, can you elaborate on this? It has happened far too often with this program that when, when a goal wasn't met, rather than do what you would expect in a good government program, which is you, you acknowledge, you, know, you, you have a goal, you set forth a plan or policy to achieve that goal, you measure performance against that goal, and if you are not performing, you change the program, so make the necessary changes to accomplish that goal. Far too often in TARP, it has been set a goal, adopt no policy to achieve that goal, um, basically ignore it, try, n try not to be incredibly transparent about the progress towards that goal. Um, when you don't meet that goal, rather than change the program, change the goal, and then declare mission accomplished, program a success, and move on. Um, that has happened with, with the housing program, certainly, um, and it has happened with a lot of the Main Street goals, which have basically been written out. Um, recently in testifying in front of the Congressional Oversight Panel, a Treasury official talked about these goals, these, these incredibly important Main Street goals that were part of the bargain. It is why TARP got passed, and dismissed them essentially as window dressing, just things to be taken into account. Well, they were intended to be more than that, and those are some of the broken promises that I discussed in the op-ed and that we discuss in our reports. Now, to, to go further on this, there has been a, a discussion in recent days that, um, that TARP has been a success for the taxpayers, um, that in dollars and cents terms it, it hasn't, been, is, is, uh, hasn't been a huge negative. What are the negatives? What, what is the legacy of, of this? Uh, well, of TARP and our unprecedented intervention in the market? Well, I think that there is there's a number of, of, of areas where TARP fell short. Um, you know, first, of course, are the goals not met, the goals that were part of the bargain that we just discussed that, that were not that. And there is a cost to, to not meeting your Main Street goals. One of those costs has been in the impact on government credibility. And the bottom line is that people don't trust their government. And part of the reason why they don't trust their government today is because of the bailout, because of the failure to meet its goals, and because, frankly, because of the mismanagement of the program. Um, secondly, one of TARP's greatest legacies is the too-big-to-fail problem. As I noted before, when, when the secretaries told the markets, we are not going to let these banks fail, this was instrumental in one of, the, one of the other positive aspects of TARP, which is helping to prevent a financial collapse. But it really exacerbated the problem of too big to fail. It, it was no longer implicit. It was ex, as explicit as it could be. The whole reason why TARP helped contributed to avoiding the economic collapse was because of the promise, we are not going to let these institutions fail. And that has had the unintended consequences of the problem of getting bigger and bigger, more concentrated. You mentioned now the statistical data that backs up what we all know, that they are able to borrow money more cheaply, they are able to access the credit markets, access the capital markets, and right now they are more systemically significant than they were before, if for no other reason that there is fewer than them and they are bigger than ever. And that is a, a real legacy. Now, has Dodd-Frank prevented that from continuing? Dodd-Frank was not a magic wand. You know, passing a piece of legislation that gave Treasury and the regulators certain powers and authorities didn't actually change the status quo. It gave one possible path that the regulators could choose to use to potentially accomplish that goal, but the bill itself is, is just that, a, a bill. Um, and unfortunately, based on the market's perception, they are very, very much unconvinced that it will be used in, in the effective way that it would need to be used in order to, to really address too big to fail. Even in the design of the bill, does it leave, up, uh, does it leave uh, wide openings uh, for bailouts to continue? Well, I mean, technically under the, the letter of the law, right, it, and there is some dispute about what, what the meaning of all this is, it, it does state that, that in, in certain language that bailouts won't happen. Um, but yeah, that sort of ignores a reality. And the reality is when we talk about too big to fail, I think far too often we lose sight of the fact what those words mean and, and, and that it means really what they say, that whether there, whether there is a law in the books or not a law in the books, if these institutions, if we have a repeat of the financial crisis, it is not going to matter what the law in the books is because its failure is not an option. You can't let those banks fail if that happens. It doesn't matter what your political ideology, it doesn't matter what your personal ideology. The country will go down the tubes. There will be a systemic crash that will have devastating consequences, Great Depression, Armageddon, no cash coming out of the ATMs. And the point is that much like with TARP, 
the White House, whoever happens to be President at the time and whoever happens to be controlling Congress at that time, for the best of the country, has to go in and rescue the banks. Um, it is not a moral question. Um, that is what too big to fail means. So while I think people can argue whether certain, interp certain interpretations and portions of Dodd-Frank, uh, which gives certain degree of discretion as to which creditors possibly um, get paid 100 cents on the dollars and which don't, which I know is, is, is a subject of the debate, um, or other provisions that's, that, that, per that, that you can point to and say, okay, this doesn't mean an orderly bankruptcy. This, gives a suggestion that these banks can continue um, in the form of a bailout, uh, whether funded by the industry or elsewhere, it is almost all beside the point, because if you have too big to fail banks, it is all going to be put to the side and we are going to be right back where we were in late 2008. So in essence, it, it, it codifies the status quo? Um, unless and until Treasury and the regulators use the powers that they have under Dodd-Frank, and a lot of these powers, frankly, they had before Dodd-Frank and went unused. Um, but unless and until they use those authorities, we are actually in the, we're in the status quo or slightly worse than the status quo, um, because this, with, with nothing, maybe you have a chance of convincing the markets. But right now the markets are looking at Dodd-Frank and they are rejecting it. Now, that is not to say that Dodd-Frank doesn't do some good things that help limit um, limit the banks. Increasing capital requirements is, is important around the edges. Um, there are the vocal rule, uh, although I think you know a lot of exceptions that may may defeat it, are all helpful to help limit in certain areas of potential risk. But the big ticket question that we're talking about today: Does it solve too big to fail? Uh, the answer is certainly not yet. And by all indications um, of what what's been happening and what the direction has been, um, I'm not I'm not entirely optimistic that it will. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I rec re recognize Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is not that I disagree with you on the point. I want to understand it a little bit better. As you advocate in your testimony today and the editorial uh, discussing Ms. Baer's recommendation to simplify or shrink, can you react to, I guess, the response to that about too big to fail, Mr. Zandi's remark, and if I could quote, there is no reasonable way of sufficiently reducing their size and complexity without jeopardizing their independence. Large European and Asian banks will gobble them up, pushing the too big to fail risk overseas and outside of our control. Cutting our banks down in size won't mean there will be any less risk taking in the financial system. It will mean that the risk taking will shift elsewhere in the financial system where it is harder to monitor and to regulate. Think hedge funds, end of quote. What would your response to that be? Well, that seems almost to me like an embracing of too big to fail. It is basically this is But is he correct? I, I don't think he's correct. I mean, I think that, you know, if you th this is this this is very similar to a different argument that's been advanced, that um, you know, our largest banks, if if they're not of the size and scope that they are, um, they're not going to be able to compete with their larger European banks. Essentially what that means, I mean, if we break that down, what it really means is that, okay, so other countries guarantee their banks and those banks have an advantage. And unless we guarantee our banks, our banks are not going to be able to compete with those other banks. I mean, that is essentially where, where, what it comes down to. So really the question becomes, are you one of, do you believe that the government should subsidize and guarantee and backstop our largest financial institutions, or do you believe that we should, allow, we should be true to our capitalist ideals and let these banks compete without an economic subsidy, a very significant subsidy that they receive? And sure, there are a number of doomsday scenarios that, that one could, could posit that if we actually use the tools of Dodd-Frank and, and were true to the idea of ending too big to fail, that there may, it may, may actually result in banks that are not as profitable as they are today. But um, there are all sorts of instances in which unfair uh, trade practices, for example, by other countries do put our capitalistic ideals at risk. You, you, I, and I am just asking, you don't see that as a possibility in the banking industry? I think it is a possibility, but I think there are other ways to deal with those policy concerns rather than embracing the idea that we should be effectively granting our largest banks a subsidy um, and essentially putting them on the books. I mean, there is very little difference it, it, when you compare where we were in the lead up to the financial crisis with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac than we are right now with some of our largest banks. It is the same type of implicit guarantee. It is the same type of distortions on the market. And in, in many ways, 
we could very well end up in that exact same situation. So sure, maybe our banks are able to reap short-term profits because they are able to compete with other banks that have subsidies. But I am going to take the other side. I am going to say if we remove this subsidy, if we remove this implicit guarantee over time, we are going to have a healthier and better banking system. This is what Chairman Ben Bernanke said recently. This is what Larry Summers said recently, that our system how would be you, stronger without it. How do you protect it. our banks in the meantime from unfair practices or unfair competition as, as it might exist? Well, again, I think you know, there is constant um, interaction. I don't think you need the light too big to fail or embrace it to be concerned about that potential risk, right? Right. right. And we shouldn't ignore it. But, but the Treasury Department has, has whole offices that are dedicated to, to dealing with foreign countries and dealing with foreign regulators through the G20. There are mechanisms to deal with, with unfair, practices, unfair practices internationally. And that is the right place to deal with them, I think, not throwing your hands up and saying we are going to subsidize our largest banks. We are going to take money out of, well, out of one pocket and put it into the pockets of the shareholders and the executives at these largest banks. And I think that is what is happening. I think one study I saw recently was $34 billion was one of the dollar subsidies that we give to our largest banks for this implicit guarantee. Um, and I say take that money and let's, let's put it elsewhere, um, and I think we will be better off. And I appreciate that. I guess the second point would be what is implied here is that this encourages banks to engage in risky behavior. Could you detail the risky behavior you see today? I'm sure. I mean, the idea of, of risky behavior is that you know banks has sort of have you know anyone who runs a bank they have especially when they're large, interconnected in so many different businesses, they're going to make decisions on how they invest their money, um, how they manage their portfolio, and the question comes of what is the level of risk that they're going to attach to each of those decisions, and the problem with too big to fail is that it impacts that decision-making process. Senator Kaufman, of the congressional, when he was chair of the o Congressional Oversight Panel, um, described it as being the rational decision of, a, of an executive when you take out the sine curve, what you call the bottom of the sine curve of, of the, in the decision-making process of, of profit and loss from a particular decision, and that what too big to fail does, it takes out the bottom of that because it is the rational assumption that if the risk doesn't work out, you are not going to have the negative consequences of that risk. Um, and and that is what, what happens with too big to fail, is that you actually rationalize risky behavior because it is in the best interest not only of the bank, but of its shareholders and its executives. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Meehan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Borofsky, for once again coming before our committee. But let me thank you as well for the service that you have given in, this, uh, in, in, in looking at this issue in, in such scope, a, a tremendous challenge to our country when it happened, but the healthy capacity to then look back at what happened and ask the kinds of difficult questions that allow us to, to consider the implications of, of all that happened so quickly with such remarkable significance uh, you know, at the height of the, the, the challenge to our financial system. So I appreciate your service to our nation, uh, and I thank you for, uh, for it and, and, and wish you the best of luck as you move into uh, the next part, but, but, but thank you for your contribution. And I know that you would say as well that that is something that has been a, a great part of it, has been the work that you have done, but you have been supported by some other fine people as well, some of whom I have known from prior existence, and I want to compliment them, too, on the great work that they have done with you uh, for, your, for your work. But, look, you have studied this. You have spent time really looking at the big picture and have had the chance to sit back, maybe more than many of the people here in Congress have. And you made a comment talking about, unless there is dramatic and quick action, we are going to head down a path. And that is a very concerning observation to me. Can you identify what you mean by dramatic and quick action or what you think we ought to be doing here in Congress to, to uh, protect against the kind of concern that you have identified in your testimony? Well, first of all, thank you for, for your kind comments. And, and it, is, it is certainly true. Um, I am the one who gets to sit at the table and I am the one who gets to take the credit for our successes and the blame for our failures, but it doesn't happen with, without the people at SIGTARP and the senior staff. And, and yes, we have both benefited from, from one individual, um, you as, as United States Attorney. Um, of course, that is my, 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 my Chief of Staff, Jeff Moulton, uh, who has uh, been you know, 
wonderful for our organization and deeply appreciative. Um, but as, as, as to your question, what I was referring to is I think we have to stay here within the realm of the possible. And I could go back and, and, and say that there are certain things um, that could have been done with Dodd-Frank, um, things like that were suggested in the Senate by Senators Brown and Kaufman um, that, that could have made this a better protecting against uh, too big to fail. But here in the realm of where we are today, there is a path. That, um, that has a better chance than most of succeeding, and that is the one that is being advocated by, by Sheila Baird, outgoing chair of the FDIC. And it is ultimately not a very dramatic um, or, you know, departure. It really is just fulfilling the mandate of Dodd-Frank. And what she has said is that you know, part of, the, part of the, the, the proposals is this living wills, where the banks are required to come up with plans of how they would be resolved in the, in the event of a financial crisis. And she came out with something, and has been saying this over and over again, uh, which on its face does not appear to be very controversial. See, she says, in order for us to carry out the mandate of Dodd-Frank, in order for us to really address too big to fail, we need to use these provisions. And if banks come up with things that are not sufficiently credible, not just to us, but to the markets, um, so that they can be resolved in a meaningful way, then we need to use the powers of Dodd-Frank to simplify and shrink those institutions. And she has had stronger language than that in, on other occasions. Um, what is remarkable about this is the deafening silence with which has been met by the other regulators, the other members of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, including as Chairman Secretary Tim Geithner. Um, this is a path that at least has a chance of working, because you know, ultimately they are too complex, they are too large. And the, you know, I think uh, Chairman Greenspan said you know, famously in the, the beginning of this crisis, too big to fail starts with too big. And it's not always too big. That, that would be an oversimplification. It's interconnectedness. It's a number of other things. But it's a really, really good place to start. But it really does appear that what's happening with Chairman Baer's suggestion is that the others are playing the equivalent of a regulatory game of running out the clock. They say nothing, they do nothing, and the bottom line is that she's not going to be able to institute those changes before she steps down over the course of the summer. And those, even those plans aren't going to be coming in, in, you know, in, a, in a matter of, of, of six months. It could be a year before anything happens. Um, so what, what would be an example of dramatic change? How about a strong endorsement from the Secretary of the Treasury, from the Chairman of the, of the Federal Reserve and others that, that Chairman Baer's suggestion is going to be adopted? Perhaps this can help chip away at the market's perception that resolution authority is somewhat of a joke. I mean, if you look at the language that Moody's used in rejecting the idea that we're going that Dodd Frank is going to work, going to somehow end too big to fail, that it, that this resolution authority is going to work, um, it's it's striking language. It's not just a passive rejection; it's a complete rejection. Well, well Moody's is one of the groups that has actually included within their analysis, the idea that the government is actually going to bail out the right, banks. They absolutely is not? I mean, they, this is part of the problem that we are looking at. Absolutely. They reject that this is, this is really going to happen. So it <clears throat> is a, it's a minor first step, but I think if we start by the government officials who are in charge of implementing Dodd-Frank, instead of issuing what are, are basically, I am sorry, empty statements that this is going to end too big to fail, as we know it, we are never going to have to bail out anyone again, citing to different provisions in the law, which I I'm, 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 which have heard and I am sure you will hear again, that, oh, well, here, this law says we can't bail out, so therefore there will never be a bailout. I mean, let us start with you know, a, an articulated, articulated plan, similar to the one advocated by Chairman Baer, saying, okay, this is how we are going to do this. We are going to simplify and shrink these institutions so we can have a credible response to the market that we are not going to bail them out. Because right now, the empty rhetoric, we are not going to bail these banks out, the market is not buying it. And you can actually measure whether or not your statements are effective or not. All you have to do is look at what the credit rating agencies say, look at what the spread is, how much cheaper the, the, the benefit is, how much cheaper it is for the big banks to raise capital. I mean, there are things you can actually look to. And while it is unfortunate that credit rating agencies still have so much power and so much influence, um, that is the sad reality of where we are today. Um, and I think that there has to be an, it has to start with an increase in rhetoric, and then it has to be backed up by, by demonstrated action to, to fulfill that rhetor those rhetorical promises. But right now we're, we don't really have any of that. What we have is, is a lot of discussion about you know, endless rulemaking that, 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 that will accomplish some goal, um, 
a real sense of incrementalism. We will do a little bit here and a little bit there, and maybe eventually the incentives will be in place that these banks may, may, re may reduce in size. Um, and I, I'm, I personally believe that Chairman Baer's approach is, is the better one. The gentleman's time has expired. Well, uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Borowski, thank you so much. As you were testifying, I could not help <clears throat> but think about the fact that come June 25th in my district, 40 miles from here, people will march into a room to a conference on preventing foreclosure. They will march in, Mr. Borowski, with tears, literally, about 1,000 of them. That is what happened at the other five and they will face some very difficult situations, and finally they will get a chance to sit down with some lenders and come try to come to some resolve uh, with regard to modifications. Many of them will be lied to. Many of them have been lied to. Played, they have been playing games with them, a lot of these servicers, as if they were fools. <clears throat> and, you know, when I read your uh, editorial piece at 425 this morning. I was very impressed. And, you know, I am just wondering, you know, we just voted um, yesterday to end the, the HAMP program. And I know why you feel about it. Many of us feel the same way. But when you end the program, if we end the program and there is nothing to substitute, nothing, I am just wondering, is that is that a good idea? I am just curious. I mean, as, as Special Inspector General, it, is, it has always been my position and continues to be my position that TARP made a promise. Um, and, and, Congressman, I don't want to presume anything about you or your decision to make your vote, but for a lot of progressives that I have spoken to, uh, members of Congress, the reason why they voted for TARP, one of the, the really things that convinced them to vote for was essentially a bank bailout was this promise to preserve home ownership. Well, that was, that was my, that my you are right, that was one of the reasons why I voted for it. So this is as part and parcel of TARP, in my view, as, the need to, the, as it was the need to save the financial system. I don't rank them, but I put them side by side. It was just as important goal of TARP to preserve home ownership and deal with the foreclosure crisis as it was to save the large bank. Now, the second panelist today disagrees with that, that conception and, and, and talks about that as being something to be taken into account, but I believe that that is, that is on par. So I look at the, the disappointment, the broken promise of the HAMP program, and I do agree with you that we can't just abandon that goal of TARP. I also can't defend, for those who, who voted against, who, vo who voted for termination of HAMP, I can't defend this program, because ultimately Treasuries had opportunity after opportunity to make meaningful change. Why on earth? have those servicers that you just described, what they have done to those homeowners in this program, which has been so well documented, how come Treasury has not lived up to a different promise it made, the promise it made in November 2009 to impose financial penalties on those servicers for not performing? Why are we here two years into the program without a single financial penalty for nonperformance under the program? And I, and I agree with you. Before they shut me down, I, I need to get to one other thing, though. You know, the reason why I started off the way I did is because, you know, I, I, we can have all these discussions we want, but when I go back to my district, and I know members on both sides of the aisles, when they go back to their district, they may, some of them may not see these folks, but there are a lot of Americans suffering. And, you know, you are talking about Too Big to Fail and Dodd-Frank. If we basically cut the money for uh, carrying out Dodd-Frank, I mean, do you have an opinion on that? I mean, because that is what is happening. You know, I am I'm come from a law enforcement background. I spent eight years at, at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And, you know, I have seen during budget freezes and hiring freezes, um, you know, at SIGTARP we have been blessed, and, and I thank all the members of this committee on, on both sides of the aisle for, for your generous support through resources for our, for our agency. We, we couldn't do what we could otherwise. Um, but th those types of budget cuts and freezes, you know, have a direct impact on the ability of those offices. Uh, to put people in jail, to lock people up, to hold people accountable. But it does, does it also have an impact, you think, 
you said that you can you know how the market is viewing Dodd Frank. You talked about the possibilities that Dodd Frank could operate, but you also said they look at it and say, you know what, you know, we're not so worried about it because you said too big to fail. But also, could it be that they see that there's an effort to kind of take the money from out of these agencies so that they can properly enforce and carry out Dodd Frank. That, that's what I'm trying to get at. Right. I, I mean, it may be part of that perception issue. Um, I mean, look, the bottom line is if the regulatory agencies that are, are charged with, because again, they're not just charged with implementing Dodd Frank. Right. They're, they're implementing other things, including law enforcement goals and, and enforcement goals. You know, I'm thinking specifically of the SEC. Um, when you take away funding, um, they, it may be that they reallocate resources to Dodd Frank, but but overall, as an agency, they are going to be able to accomplish less as far as enforcement is concerned um, and accomplish less, perhaps, in, in, in implementing Dodd-Frank. And I am not here to, to wade into the, uh, no, the politics of a budget battle. But, but look, I mean, it is just simple. I have seen it over and over again. When budget cuts hit, when, higher, when, when spending freezes hit, it has a direct impact on enforcement. That is a reality. And just one last thing, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, the Wall Street Journal article recently noted that Republicans appear to be drafting bills aimed at dismantling the financial reform uh, piece by piece at a time. And what impact do you think that these repeated news reports about defunding or dismantling Dodd-Frank have on the market's perception of whether Dodd-Frank uh, is working? To be honest with you, I am not really sure of what, what the impact is, um, in, in part because of the political realities of, of divided government. Um, you know, it is a question of, of, of how much success one, you know, one side may have versus the other side. Um, I haven't really traced anything or seen anything or heard anything that directly links that. Um, but of course, if, again, if, if the agencies are cut so deeply to the bone that they are unable to um, implement provisions of, of regulatory reform, that is going to have an impact. But I think the far greater impact, frankly, is, is the lack of political and regulatory will in staking out how they are going to use those authorities, even if they have all the resources, to, to really take on the issue of too big to fail. Um, and unless and until we see that shift, uh, I think that is going to have the far greater impact on market perception. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Ranking Member. And uh, Ms. Burkle is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Borofsky, for being here this morning. And uh, to echo my colleagues' uh, comments to you and your staff, thank you for all the fine work that you do. I have one general question, and then I'd like to just um, ask a couple of questions about some of the comments you've made already. Um, would you agree that uh, TARP picked winners, perhaps letting uh, weaker entities survive, and if so? Uh, do you think that that maybe was a misallocation of funds? Well, when you look at TARP as a whole, I think that the, the lack of transparency in the program in certain aspects have led to the, the, the very fair criticism that at times TARP may have picked winners and losers. Um, I mean, generally speaking, when, when we are talking about the, the different TARP programs, and of course there's there's, there was 13 different TARP subprograms, so it's hard to think of, of it's, you know, we often think of TARP as a monolith, and usually then we think of TARP as one of those programs, the capital purchase programs, which by very definition picked winners and losers because banks applied for TARP funds and some received TARP funds and, and others didn't, um, and those who received TARP funds essentially got the benefit of, of government capital and those that did not. Um, but there was, in fact, a, a process in place um, that was dependent mostly on, on, on the bank's regulatory ratings, their CAMELS ratings, that type of, of thing. And on certain occasions there were, were exceptions, and we have done audit work on this. So certainly there were winners and losers picked. The TARP certainly didn't have a perfect record. Um, you know, there have been a number of banks that were um, supposedly healthy, deemed healthy and viable, that failed, uh, others that were deemed healthy and viable and months later had to get tremendous amount of additional support like Bank of America and, and, and Citigroup. Um, so, so I certainly understand that concern. Um, on the flip side, it would have probably been inappropriate for TARP you know, to give money to all financial institutions that came to the window. Uh, part of the importance of protecting taxpayer money was making sure that it went into banks that were healthy and viable, um, but they didn't have a perfect track record. But I don't blame them for not having a perfect track record. It is sort of, I think that when, you know, based on our audit work and our 
our reporting. Uh, it was an incredibly difficult time, uh, to say the least. There was a real sense of panic. Um, they made mistakes, for sure, um, but I don't think those were mistakes that were uh, you know, intentional in any way, and that overall I think they tried to get it right, um, they just didn't sometimes. Thank you. And then I just want to go back to a comment that uh, when you were uh, responding to our chairman, you mentioned that unless Treasury and the regulators use their authorities, and you mentioned that some of those authorities they already have, uh, that we will um, experience a status quo or worse. Could you expand on that for me, the authorities that you are referring to and whether or not they exist outside of Dodd-Frank, prior to Dodd-Frank, actually? I mean, I think the concept of, of for, for example, caps on leverage, um, uh, capital, you know, fl capital floors are, are sort of examples of things that have been around for a while. Um, I think what Dodd-Frank does, and this is sort of one of the positive things it does, it really it forces an entry point for using those, um, those types of mechanisms um, anticip anticipatorily. In other words, again, I am going to go back to a discussion earlier about using living wills. This gives us an entry to evaluate the largest banks, those deemed systemically significant, and evaluate whether or not they really could survive uh, or whether the system could survive their failure. And that is the key to any resolution plan, is to take whatever it is and, as, as Chairman Baer suggests, putting it through a reality check. And if it doesn't meet that reality check, using those tools to either spin off certain businesses, uh, to shrink the company, to simplify their organizational structure. If you, if you look at some of the, the, the stuff that came out of the Lehman bankruptcy and the the 3,200 and something different uh, entities that were comprised are hopelessly, hopelessly, com hopelessly complex that makes resolution very difficult. I mean, I think that is a good start. Of course, we also have to remember that one of the limitations of if, if we wait too long, um, in other words, we don't use the authorities when we get these resolution plans prescriptively before the next financial crisis, even our best intentions may not really work, because in, in an era of a financial crisis, when, you know, it's, that is when all of these institutions are suffering similar threats at the same time, it is going to be very difficult to execute some of these resolution plans. How do you sell off a large business or a large business chunk as part of a resolution if there is no one to buy it because the other entities are also going through the same stress of, as a, of, of a financial system collapse? And I think that is what Secretary Geithner meant when he said to us, that Dodd-Frank helps, but in the event of, a, of another financial crisis, the size and the scope of the one that we just went through, you know, there may be a need to do ex exceptional things again, because even with the best intentions, um, the, the reality of that type of, of shock to the system is going to require, um, you know, unless, as long as the banks are too big, uh, it is going to require, again, extraordinary intervention. Thank you very much. Mr. Welch, five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Borowski, I want to uh, thank you for the tremendous uh, work that you have done. Uh, we are really in your debt. Thank you. Uh, this question, if, as I understand it, what you are saying is that uh, Dodd-Frank has not succeeded in making the market believe that it has addressed this question and too big to fail. In, in essence, the implementation of Dodd-Frank has not succeeded in convincing the market. And when you say the implementation, is that because of the regulatory uh, 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 provisions that had to be a part of the follow-up of Dodd-Frank? Right. So much of Dodd-Frank put the responsibility on the regulators and, and, frankly, on the Treasury Department as the chair of the Financial Stability Oversight Council to implement the necessary changes and send the right messages to the market. So we would have been better off with Congress specifying what uh, were the guidelines and what were the parameters with, within which these large financial institutions could operate? Is that what would have been a better approach? Well, it would have, I'm not going to say whether it was a, a better approach. It would have been a more effective approach uh, if ideas like the Senator Brown's and Senator Kaufman's amendment in the Senate to Dodd-Frank, which would have put uh, leverage caps and size caps on, on, on the largest institutions, if that had passed, that would have sent a, a very large and very clear message to the markets right. that, that the largest banks are not going to be too big to fail, and much simpler. It would have, it would have, you would have relied a lot less on the regulators um, if, if that were included. All right. And then when we get into the regulators, we are, of course, having a budget uh, 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 challenge in this country and in this Congress. Uh, 
and if we're cutting uh, the budget for, for instance, the SEC by $25 million, uh, how does that affect uh, the what kind of signal does that send, and how does that affect the ability to uh, actually supervise the regulations that would apply? Well, according to the SEC, uh, it would have you know a very direct a direct result. Um, it would you know it inhibit their ability, uh, according to, to Chairman Shapiro, of, of being able to implement um, the requirements that they need to do under under Dodd Frank. Right, and in your independent capacity, that conclusion that they're offering makes sense to you. That's a threat to their ability to carry out their responsibilities. There is no question. When, when you are in a regulatory agency, a law enforcement agency, and you have fewer resources, um, you have to make cuts. You have to make, frankly, you have to make cuts across the board. Everything suffers. So that will suffer. All I right. think enforcement will that, suffer. And, uh, the same thing with the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Board. Uh, that uh, Dodd-Frank called for an independent watchdog, uh, and that would be independent. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, in there advocating for the interest of the large financial institutions. It would be advocating for the interest uh, of consumers. And the CR provision, the continuing resolution provision, would cut that budget by 40 percent from about $143 million to $80 billion. So would you have the same response to that budgetary cut and its impact on being able to provide those protections? Um, I would imagine so. I am not really familiar with the budget of the Consumer Protection Bureau uh, and, and what the requirements are. But, again, um, having been fortunate enough to work with, uh, with Elizabeth Warren as she was the, the chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel, um, I would certainly take her at her word that if, if this would impact the ability of that, that bureau and, to go forward, that okay, it, let me it ask should be you accurate. This. One of the points of this hearing is there are some legitimate questions about how TARP is being implemented and whether too big to fail is going to work. Uh, and it is not clear what the consensus would be on this committee as to whether we would want to be tougher on the too-big-to-fail policy or not. That is not part of what the hearing is. But let us assume that we did have a view uh, that was shared across the aisle, both sides, where we did want to protect the taxpayer from a future bailout. What would be your recommendation that Congress should do in order to pre provide us with protection against another bailout? Well, I think, again, step one is, is, is working within the realm of the possible of, of the bill that has already been passed, um, and, and that is to exert as much pressure as you can on the Financial Stability Oversight Council, on, on Secretary Geithner. Um, to, to fulfill the promise and, and to, to not take an incrementalist approach, but to, to take a strong, hard look at the, the recommendations and the advocacy of Chairman Baer and use those tools. And the goal should be nothing short of, of getting rid of that subsidy, getting rid of that economic advantage that the largest banks have over their smaller counterparts, whether it is the 78 basis points um, referenced in, in, in the Chairman's opening statement, whether it is the, um, you know, the implicit guarantee, the increased credit rating. Um, that has to be a goal, because this is the remarkable thing about too big to fail. Perception matters. Perception is as important as anything else. Um, and it has, it's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate the red, credit rating agencies still have so much influence over things, but that's the reality. And we need to take that perception head on, and we need to figure out how to use the tools that we currently have to try to deal with that perception, and not just, I'm sorry, essentially ignore the advocacy of Chairman Baer and others who are who who have strong ideas about trying to get us to a point where they don't these banks no longer enjoy that subsidy. If the gentleman yield, I, I, I would be happy to. I, I think we agree that we want to end too big to fail, um, and I know that's been your advocacy uh, in your time in Congress as, as well as mine. Um, the bill of goods that some of us saw coming out of Dodd Frank is that it would prevent too big to fail, um, and I'd be happy. Well, I, I appreciate that, and as the chairman uh, knows, I voted. Uh, really in significant part because of the testimony of Mr. Borowski uh, in favor of the committee bill on HAMP. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that we can find ways to solve the problem, we have got to do it together. So I really appreciate your, your, your statement. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the gentleman's advocacy. We don't always agree, but you have certainly had a, a great uh, way of reaching out and trying to find consensus. I appreciate that. Uh, with that, I yield uh, five minutes to Mr. Issa, the chairman of the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would, I would join in saying that as we start looking at the particulars of the continuing resolution, uh, 
if we can get to some bipartisan discussion where we agree to the number and then begin saying, if we need to add to SEC, or as Mr. Borowski, I'm sure, would agree, some of the sunlight uh, websites and so on that are also seeing cuts, uh, plus those back up because they actually save us money, uh, then I think we could find those offsets. I think as the Chairman worked so hard to recognize that HAMP was a large amount of money that did not need to be spent to ruin people's credit ratings, uh, it is still at the same time, I would join the gentleman saying, look, I am concerned about where we make the cuts, and I would hope that in the very near future we begin talking about the need to make uh, austerity moves and then begin to say where can we find multiple votes for something by putting things back in. And, and you would mentioned the SEC. I am very concerned that many of the sunlight activities that we have on a bipartisan basis been investing in uh, are also on the block there. And it is my intention to work with leadership on whatever the final resolution is once we get with the Senate to plus those back up. I think we need to have the access that, quite frankly, Dodd-Frank uh, with bipartisan support of this committee almost got in the way of data transparency, and, and we still have to get back as a committee to getting that transparency into what was Dodd-Frank. Uh, if I can, uh, Mr. Borowski, if I can uh, throw a slide up, uh, I want to just go through a couple of these because it, or, it illustrates probably the most important point you are making today, uh, which is the 2 to dash 3 step credit rating increase. Go to the next slide. Real examples. Uh, Wells Fargo, if their cost of money is 4.81 versus Co-America at 5.26. Next slide. If Goldman Sachs, vilified often here, but if their cost of money is four, just under 5 percent, well, uh, National City is over 6 percent. That is not the, the three-quarters of a point you were talking about. It is even greater. Next slide. Uh, Barclays Bank uh, at 4.39 versus BB&T, certainly important in this region. Uh, a little less than three quarters of a point, 5.07 higher. Uh, last, Citicorp, 5.64, not earned in any way except that they are big. National, uh, Huntington National Bank, 6.54. Let me ask it to you in a different way as a, a former businessman. If I am among the most credit worthy companies, the Fortune 500, down to small companies that simply have healthy balance sheets. Is there any reason in the world that, that they are not going to migrate to the largest banks when the largest bank can make a profit nearly a point cheaper than its competition? Pure, pure cost of money. Isn't this going to move the most credit worthy onto the, uh, the big banks while well, leaving the little banks with higher rates and being forced to take whatever is left behind? No, absolutely. Because again, if you're, let's say you're depositing money at one of these banks, and you know you go beyond the uh, FDIC's limit, um, don't you want to have the implicit government guarantee of, of too big to fail behind your deposits? I mean, you you may, as an from an ethical and moral point of view, not want to support these institutions because of this implicit government guarantee. But as a businessman. How could you not take advantage of, of the fact that you are getting what is essentially um, free deposit insurance based on the implicit guarantee that the government is going to, to bail them out? And what does that do? It makes them bigger. It makes them even more systemically important. It is a, it's a downward spiral. It also takes those, those smaller banks, it gives them an incentive as well. We need to get bigger. We need to get into this gravy train. We need to get on this subsidy level so that we can also outprice our competition and raise money more cheaply just because of this implicit guarantee. It is a complete perversion of the system. Well, and I think that brings up a point that I want to make sure the committee focuses on. If we do not change where we are today, the five banks that represent 50 percent will be seven banks that represent 80 percent. Basically, through mergers, the little banks will get this rate by getting big enough to be not too big to fail, right? Um, that, is, that is definitely That would be the business approach in order to get my business uh, away from the big five. Um, it, is, it is a real danger. Um, I mean, there are some provisions in Dodd-Frank that, that limit concentration above 10 percent of, of all deposits, but, but it, is a, it is a real concern and a real 
problem. And, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about is, is Lehman, and wasn't Lehman a good example of, of the government not stepping in? But so much of the incentive of, of, the, of allowing Lehman to fail was the lesson that we need to get bigger than Lehman, because we need to make sure that we are big enough that we don't have to go through a bankruptcy because of the implicit guarantee of too big to fail. Well, thank you, and thank you for your service and your testimony here today. I look forward to reading your, uh, your work as an academic. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now I recognize uh, Mr. Ross of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Porosky, a, a, a pleasure to have you here. Um, you know, as I was a kid growing up, I remember um, commercials and, and, and the Avis commercial. We try harder because we are number two. And all of a sudden, you know, number one seems to now be in the financial markets a guarantee by the Federal Government. And that whoever is number two, you know, good luck to them because you can try as hard as you want. As long as you are too big to fail, you know, you will always be number one. And so my, my question, and I will follow up with the Chairman here. Uh, with, with community banks, if we see what happens where you have seven banks take 80 percent of the market, it seems to me that there is an incentive only for community banks uh, to, to merge with or to be acquired by the, the too big to fail banks. Is that what we are setting up a precedent with, with, with uh, the, the TARP package? Well, again, there, there's some limits on the, there, there potentially could be some limits in Don Frank and, and from the regulators that could help to prevent the, the largest banks from just gobbling up all the, all the smaller community banks uh, over a certain cap. But certainly consolidation and continued consolidation um, certainly could occur and might be a likely byproduct of where we are. Which wouldn't be healthy for, really wouldn't be that healthy for the consumer or in this state of economy that we have today where the community banks are the ones that are serving most of our, our businesses uh, in terms of loans, it, 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 it could give them uh, what I think would be uh, an opportunity for the, the big, too big to fail banks to dictate more policy and, and restrictions that would make it even more prohibitive to have a recovering economy. Less competition is never good for the consumer. Um, and I have to say, although the notion of the too big to fail banks of having even more political power almost seems unfathomable at this point, but it certainly could happen. Oh. Um, systemically, as a result of, of, of the TARP package, and I may have missed this because I came in late, but has there been anything to change the way we do business to avoid ever having to have another TARP package uh, passed by this Congress? In many ways, the way the TARP has been executed and it is the way its legacy of increased moral hazard um, has made future ballots, if anything, more likely. Um, and, you know, and less than until we deal with this too big to fail problem, the increased concentration, the increased size, the increased interconnectedness, the fewer uh, number of large institutions, all will contribute and lead us to a point where the too big to fail banks have become even bigger and their failure even less conceivable or possible. And would it not be just as likely then, because of the precedent, precedent set there, that, that such packages, TARP packages, would, would now be considered for non-financial uh, institutions, insurance companies. I mean, we've saw, we saw that with AIG. But, but I guess my question is, 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 does this not set a precedent that goes well beyond uh, assisting the too big to fail financial institutions and to any entity that may be deemed to be too big to fail, regardless of what their, 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 their commercial purpose is? The moral hazard generated by TARP wasn't just limited to banks. It was, as you said, to insurance companies like AIG, to the automobile industry like right. GM and Chrysler. So, so, so no, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's part of TARP's legacy is, is the expanding moral hazard. And, and, and as a professor, I, I guess, would, would it be wise now in, in, in any of your, your classes that you would consider, uh, you know, the, 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 the opportunity of changing your business plan to include, um, you know, a path to where you can now be acquired or be um, guaranteed by Federal Government because of the precedent that has been set over the last two years? Um, it certainly is a possibility, unless, and again, unless we take the steps to make that so painful um, and, and you know, really address it through, through our regulation, um, again, right now, it is a pretty good place to be, to be too big to fail. Yeah. So much for entrepreneurship. I yield back. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. And uh, with that, uh, I ask unanimous consent that uh, I have two additional minutes, and I will grant the, um, the uh, full committee Ranking member or the gentleman from Welch, uh, from Vermont, Mr. Welch, uh, two minutes if that, if you are. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Broski, I have spoken to you uh, about uh, the Small Business Lending Fund, um, this 
legislative creation um, that doesn't have uh, oversight from your office, uh, from the SIGTARP's office. Can you talk about the Small Business Lending Fund and the impact this has, especially on, on these TARP banks, uh, these small TARP banks that are still within the program? Sure. I mean, part of the Small Business Lending Fund, Congress enabled Treasury to um, refinance, if you will, really move banks off of the TARP ledger and onto the SBLF ledger. And when doing so, Congress gave Treasury the authority and direction to um, adopt certain procedures uh, that were different for the TARP banks than other banks that, that come in and apply, to this pro apply for this program. And we made a series of recommendations to Treasury which have been rejected uh, to help protect the American taxpayer uh, as those banks move from, again, from, from the TARP ledger to the SBLF ledger. Um, and, and look, there is less oversight in the SBLF program. There are less protections, capital protections for the taxpayer. And we have made a couple of recommendations and they have been rejected. Um, it is not entirely within our, juris our jurisdiction. On this issue, it very much is within our jurisdiction because we have jurisdiction over the sale of troubled assets. And here, the sale of the preferred shares of stock, which essentially are being sold from one government entity and purchased by another government entity, is, is very much, in our view, within the confines of our jurisdiction, which is why we have announced an audit uh, specifically on this issue. Uh, unfortunately, Treasury is, is, is dithering on whether or not they think we have this jurisdiction. Uh, we have tried to schedule an, entry, an entrance conference, and we were told uh, to hold off for a little bit because the Treasury General Counsel has to decide whether or not we have the right to conduct an audit of the exit of banks from, from TARP. Now, I haven't written a letter, I haven't made a big deal about this, because, frankly, uh, I can't even conceive that they are going to come out and suggest that the very clear intent of Congress that we have jurisdiction over the exit of, of TARP banks isn't going to be there. And because you know, the money hasn't funded into this program yet, we don't have this great sense of immediacy of getting this, this, this entrance scheduled. Um, but you know, if there is some bizarre legal construct, construct that they, they adopt and, and suggest that, that we can't do this work, um, I will certainly hope that my successor will immediately bring that to, to this committee's attention, because this is a really important area uh, because of the potential for the taxpayer to really to get a raw deal as TARP banks exit TARP and go into SBLF. And needs, we need very close oversight. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, I, I yield uh, two minutes to the uh, full committee ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Yeah. <clears throat> Spirovsky, back on, on uh, February 25th, I requested <clears throat> that your office conduct an audit and analyze the homeowner complaints. Can you tell me what is going on with that and when we can expect to have uh, some results? I just got an email that has the preliminary numbers. Mm -hmm. We are going through, I think it is more than 25,000 hits to our hotline. Um, and part of what this has been helpful is helping us to, to organize and categorize our, our hotline hits. And so since we have gotten your letter, our staff has been going through our hotline um, literally entry by entry and pulling it together. Um, and I got, I got noticed just last night that we have um, some preliminary results. So I expect that we will have it to you before too long. I, I don't want to give you an exact date because you know, let's, when, when, you're, when you're walking out, you shouldn't uh, dump on the people behind you with a commitment that you can't, can't deliver. But I will definitely have staff get in touch with your staff today to give you an estimate of the time frame. Thank you. That may be one of your last duties, huh? Uh, <laughs> probably, yes. I think so. Let me ask you this. One of the things that um, concerns me is that we are going to, um, you know, as you move on, the question becomes, um, you know, and Mr. Masai is going to testify in a few minutes. I remember when I was practicing law, one of the things I would say if one witness wasn't side by side with the other, which is never, I would say, what, what would your response be to what they are going to say in some way or another? You know, you, you, it sounds like you made some reasonable recommendations. And Mr. Massad, who will testify in a few minutes, has said that, Mr. Chairman, that he's going to come in and he's going to, he told us a month or so ago that he was going to be retooling. And have you seen any evidence of that? And why wouldn't the administration accept some of your recommendations? I mean, why do you think? And I'm just curious because there's a lot of frustration on both sides of the aisle. And I'm just curious as to what you think. 
There's been no retooling. Um, you know, the, what the, the announcement yesterday, yesterday, we, which I think non coincidentally was on the, the date of the, the vote, of, of course, in the House to terminate HAMP, um, there was an announcement and read it with some interest. It was an op ed in Politico uh, that Mr. Mass had authored. And, and essentially it said that they are going to now, finally, two years later, almost 18 months after the promise to impose financial penalties on, on nonperforming servicers, there is going to be a plan. So, so I read the op-ed, it was brought to my attention, and frankly, it's, it sounded initially like a little bit of a gimmick. The idea is they are going to give servicers grades and then withhold payments based on that grade. But okay, at least it is some movement in that direction. Um, although, again, words, I don't put a lot of faith in words at this point, given the words that we had almost 18 months ago. You know, it is action that matters. Um, so I did what, you would normally, what I would normally do in that situation. I reached out to the, to the Treasury and said, okay, give us the backup for this. Let us give us so we can evaluate. So if I am asked the question today in front of this committee, I can give an opinion about whether this is going to be effective, what the construct is. And, and the response back I get, first I got no response. Um, and then eventually we got a response that, no, 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 we can't tell you because we don't have any other policy or plan other than what was outlined in the op-ed. This is ready, fire, aim all over again with respect to this program. So this has been the one incidence of potential retooling, of finally meeting our recommendation, not just our recommendation, almost everyone's recommendation, to, to, to start holding, holding servicers accountable financially. Um, and I am hopeful. You know, I am hoping that this is better late than never as opposed to too little too late. But ultimately, words at this point are just words. And after all of the broken promises, um, we need to see some action on this front if we are ever going to get the servicers to be held accountable for, for their, their terrible and abysmal performance uh, that even Treasury acknowledges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I thank the Ranking Member. And, uh, Mr. Borowski, uh, we certainly appreciate your testimony, your candor, um, your uh, ability to actually react to a whole variety of questions. Uh, uh, you know, too often in Congress we, we see the person on the other side of the panel um, as, uh, as more of sport. Um, it is it's quite interesting to have someone who is on the other side of the panel who is of sporting mood, you know, that you are willing to react and, and answer the question posed to you. Um, too often in this place and around Washington, it is not about answering the question posed to you, it is about what you want to answer. Um, and you have been very frank, very forthcoming, very open. Uh, in, in answering the questions posed to you, even when they are not convenient. And we certainly appreciate your service to your government uh, and to your country. And thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, most of all, thank you for your hard work. Thank you, uh, sir. Good luck to you and uh, your future endeavors. God bless. Thank you and so much. This committee will now be in recess for five minutes uh, until we uh, set for uh, the second panel.